poster child for lean and uh, advanced manufacturing. Actually, there was a 30-year gap between the first cars that were very expensive luxury items, handmade, uh, not dissimilar to construction today. The big shift was, of course, when they started making things at scale, standardising components, the cost of the time plummeted, and that was the big disruption. I think we're sort of here, so we've got lots of individual systems that people are developing. What I think we need is to get this sort of scale repeatability that will allow us to do the things that the automotive has done. Um, loads of people understand the kind of platform principle in uh, automotive, so you know the BMW has a single chassis that every car is built upon. My favourite example is the shipping container. So before 1956, when the multimodal shipping container was invented, uh, shipping was much like construction is now incredibly inefficient, very labour intensive, uh, about a third of the cost of anything was its transportation cost, which meant that supply chains were very short, things didn't go very far, and uh, the economy was sort of very localised. The day that this uh, was launched, the first ship that came, the cost of shipping dropped 93% in a morning. Um, the guy who developed it, Malcolm McLean, then surprised everyone by open sourcing the dimensions and the twist locks, which is the thing that makes it work, which everyone thought was mental because he was sitting on a gold mine, his view was that he would rather have a tiny, tiny slice of just a vast pie. Um, what he didn't see coming was then you get ships and docks and cranes, you get a whole physical infrastructure invented around those dimensions and the twist locks, and then you get uh, software that matches buyers and sellers, optimises uh, individual containers, optimises ships, so you get a whole digital physical infrastructure um, the result is this massive transformative effect on the economy. It's why we have a global economy, it's why supply chains are now global, it's why we can afford to ship things around the world, mm. because of a bit of standardisation and a bit of open sourcing leading to physical and digital things. So you can start to see why we're sort of you know, drawing parallels between this and what we plan to do in construction. The impact of that was vast, that's what we need to be doing. Um, a bit close to home, literally close to home, uh, I'm sure everyone in the room has at some point made a, a Billy Stone wardrobe or, or equivalent. So IKEA have got a very well-defined platform. I'm sure you know they've got a limited number of connectors that get used on absolutely everything. So they get vast amounts of customization and a wide range of products with a tiny, tiny handful of components that get used over and over again. Again, that they've gotten very, very good at this now. So prior to IKEA, if you wanted a wardrobe, you either bought an expensive thing or you found a craftsman. After IKEA, everyone is effectively a joiner. Everyone can make furniture. Um, I actually think that the, the analogy goes a bit deeper as well. So when you go to IKEA, you don't buy a wardrobe that's fully manufactured and stick it on the roof of your car and try and get it home because that would be a bit bizarre. Um, what you do is you buy things as a kit of parts and you know that that's a logistically efficient and sensible way to get the wardrobe home in the back of your car. When you get home, you don't then make the wardrobe on the drive and think, well, that's close, I've just got to get it around the corner and up the stairs and into the, into the bedroom. You take the kit of parts to the point of use, you make the wardrobe there and you're done. So in my head, that's what platforms is starting to look at, is much more, you know, there's lots and lots to talk about off-site at the moment. I think what we would like to do with platforms is start to understand what is the real appropriate level of off-site versus on-site. If I can create much more productive conditions on-site, I don't necessarily need the factory, the big <coughs> fixed, uh, big capital asset to make the things in. So we're starting to understand or starting to get our heads around what is the right level of uh, on-site activity, how could you use componentized elements to start to change the way we put buildings together? And I think it's one of the questions that we should be collectively debating. Um, <clears throat> Keith mentioned the, the IPA can call. For anyone who was paying attention, there's actually been a sort of a, a very well coordinated aligned sequence of events that have happened since sort of back in 2017. Um, so the government said the autumn statement it will use its purchasing power to drive adoption of modern methods of construction. So I think everyone quotes the presumption in favour of off-site bit, which it also says, uh, again, I think we're at a point where we start, we need to start being a bit more nuanced about the language. So I referenced a bit about modern methods of construction, not necessarily the off-site thing. Uh, there was then a whole series of reports, industrial strategy came out, House of Lords weighed in, and then I think not coincidentally, last year in November, 
the IPA put out its call for evidence on PDFMA in the same week that the Construction Innovation Hub was set up and awarded the 72 million. So this, I think, articulates very well what government means by platforms and what its articulation of this really means. Construction Innovation Hub is here to develop that, test that, you know, take the theory and hopefully turn it into practice and something very scalable. Probably everyone in this room has read this document. This is an excerpt from the PDFMA. Is there anyone who hasn't read the PDFMA call for evidence that went out? Yeah, a couple of you. Um, I would really strongly recommend you download that. If you Google IPA PDFMA, that would probably be one of the first hits that comes up. Um, I think it articulates incredibly well what we mean by platform. So it's, it's this idea of standard components, a digital library of components, which then have a physical analog uh, using those components as often as possible to try and get levels of repeatability and scalability and all the rest of it, uh, and using single components across multiple sectors. So I feel one of the things that holds the industry back is that people think in terms of silos, in terms of design disciplines, and they think in terms of sectors. I think we need to start breaking the barriers between the different disciplines and start thinking much more holistically <coughs> into what manufacturing does well. And I think we need to stop thinking in terms of schools and hospitals and housing and everything else and start thinking in terms of technical performance. Uh, it's driving me a bit mad at the moment. People seem to focus on housing and everything else. And again, no, it's all the same problem. We've got to build much, much more of everything. If we could start to use common components, then you'd start to unlock a load of these things. Um, three things that IPA pulls out, design to manufacture, Platform approach, which is this kind of kit components and open for manufacturing use and procurement. So this is the shipping container thing of how can we make these components broadly available? How can we stop this thing of individuals benefiting and developing their own little system? How do we start to scale it? How do we start to make it available? Uh, how do we start to really do the Henry Ford thing by making you know, a level of repeatability that will massively help us? <coughs> so we've been working on this for some time, as I think lots of people know. One of the things we're trying to do in developing these platforms is drag into the components design as much as we can about manufacture, but also procurement, uh, assembly techniques, skills, training, all the rest of it. So we're trying to get a library of digital components which contain a whole load of uh, knowledge within themselves about the entire supply chain procurement, installation, assembly, disassembly, all of that stuff and get much, much more holistic, as Keith says, you know, a very much broader view of what we're trying to do with the components than just get a building up quickly and cheaply. We're trying to tackle much more than that. Um, borrowing from IKEA, we're trying to turn buildings into kits of parts. And like IKEA, we're trying to turn into kits of parts that don't rely on skilled trades. So we're starting to broaden the, the amount of people who could build a building. Um, and there's a whole range of, I, Mark and I have spent a long time arguing about what is the right terminology. So in cars, it's body in white, powertrain, rag and fluff. <clears throat> I love the term rag and fluff. Um, we've been sort of going back and forth and trying to describe what we mean by platforms. I think this is still the thing that works for me. Um, so superstructure, I think, is different to everything else in a platform. Um, if you get the superstructure right, we talk about it internally as a sort of carrier frame. If you get the superstructure right and it's millimetre perfect and it's you know it's done all the things it needs to, everything else then becomes a very very this becomes your sort of chassis that everything else is designed to kind of clip into, fit around. My guess would be that we'll start building buildings with superstructure that's there forever. So most of the carbon is in the superstructure. My guess is we won't build buildings which are actually designed to be disassembled and reappropriated. I think we'll build superstructures which are kind of a loose fit and designed to do multiple functions. So some of the things that you know people love living in Victorian houses, they've been chopped and changed, but actually the, the kind of superstructure that's still there, but but for debate. Um, you then get envelope fit out MEP, obviously slotting into that. Envelope talks to fit out through grids and getting windows and things in the right place. Envelope talks to MEP through things like the thermal mass and the air tightness and the uh, location of windows immediately has an impact on the amount of heating, cooling, overheating that you have to deal with. So there's a very strong relationship. And we would like to see MEP and fit out brought together as a single thing. So if you can start to combine those, then you start to get kits of parts that do multiple things. Surrounding this uh, are the kind of the, the, the more digital elements. 
So we've started doing some of this with particularly uh, MOJ and Smart for Education, starting to understand what is the kind of uh, rationalised set of spaces that government needs to buy all the things it needs to build. How could you start to rationalise technical specifications? So rather than every department having 15 wall specifications, can we get 12 wall specifications that do the entire government estate? Because it would just immediately get a kind of level of repeatability that would immediately help people start to gear up and get a pipeline. Um, you might have seen we started work on some of these configurator tools, digital tools. So I think if you can get the components right here, you then start to build your digital library and talk, Keith's talked about the kind of digital aspects of this. I would like to see in the future then a marketplace of people who are pre-qualified to deliver these things which are bought digitally through some sort of you know, Amazon-like marketplace and you can start to see how design tools, configuring components, <coughs> creating builds and materials that go out to known suppliers, that would immediately start to kind of transform the way we buy things and get rid of a lot of the inefficiency and transactional cost that is currently in the system. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you might have seen some of these over the last couple of weeks. We've launched uh, a configurator for housing for the Mayor of London and one for primary schools for DfE. These are all uh, open source. We've published all the codes. We're hoping that's the start of a conversation, people building upon these and starting to work out what are the real digital tools we'll need to do this, because it probably isn't this. But hopefully this is a start of a conversation of a community of people developing the appropriate digital things that Keith talked about with the right levels of security and the right levels of resilience and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, we're going to talk a bit about superstructure because that's probably the platform bit that we've collectively accelerated furthest. As I say, I think it does, uh, it, it does a, a huge number of things the superstructure in terms of uh, fire and acoustics and load bearing, vibration, dimensional, most, as I say, lots of embodied carbon, uh, speed of erection, if you can get the superstructure working very hard, then everything else starts to become <coughs> dead simple. I'm assuming we're going to set these slides out, are we, at the end? Yeah, okay, so by all means take photos, but I think we'll publish them uh, so we can read them at length. Uh, I won't go through this because it's far too wordy, <clears throat> but yeah, what we're trying to do is find the absolute sort of uh, minimum amount of material that we need to do the maximum amount of work, so how little concrete, how little carbon can we put into a thing that then also does all these other things. How can we get it up, make it incredibly quick and cheap, but also then facilitate all the other platform components. So we did a thought exercise a couple of years ago now, wasn't it, this, um, where we, Keith and I, a group of others, sat in a room and said, look, if you think about the way government buys things, you could plot every space it buys in terms of the size of the room and the height of the room. And our guess at the time was if you plotted all the things government buys, you would end up with a sort of cluster of spaces which could be served by a kind of small scale residential platform which would do student accommodation, secure accommodation for MOJ, single living accommodation for uh, defence. <coughs> The sort of mid-span general purpose platform that would do schools and classrooms and small offices and uh, apartment buildings and a kind of big empty sheds kit of parts. We've since done this exercise with all the departments that were listed in the, in the um, uh, autumn statement and yeah it reinforces the fact that you could with a relatively small kit of parts do massive amounts of building for government. Uh, particularly platform two which is the one we focused on we reckon has the broadest use. So lots of buildings have a sort of seven to eight metre span, a corridor, seven to eight metre span. So schools do, apartments do, hospitals do. So I guess is if you've got platform two working really hard, you could do lots and lots and lots of building types using exactly the same kit of parts, just used over and over and over again. And they can be endlessly configurable. You can get a lot of uh, specificity in your buildings like, like car industry does. Every car is sort of mass customised, high levels of specificity with high levels of standardisation. Those two things aren't incongruous, and that's what we need to get to. So this was the Platform 2 superstructure. We actually built this up at a prison site uh, for the MOJ. So features to note, uh, the end result is not weird. So we've got concrete slab, because it's good for fire acoustics, but just a lot, a lot less concrete. Uh, and the rebar in it is very, very highly optimised. Steel columns, because they're very small in section, you can bury them in walls, they don't affect net to growth so much, they give you massive flexibility, but steel and concrete, 
very, very warrantable, mortgageable, uh, fundable, so there's nothing bizarre or risky in the end product. The way we deliver it is unusual though, so if you buy a fabricated steel frame, it's about two and a half thousand pounds a ton. If you buy square hollow sections, uh, direct from a <coughs> manufacturer, such as Tata are in the room, but other manufacturers are available, it's about 800 quid a tonne. So the thing you want is the 800 pound a tonne performance, the thing you pay for is all of the inefficiency in that going from the manufacturer to the stockholder to the fabricator to the site, getting knocked about a bit, getting you know, assembled by skilled craftsmen. So when we build platform two, we literally buy square hollow sections with one hole punched or laser cut, it comes to site. We use a thing called Comfloor, which is a commoditized product made by the mile that gets brought to site. Um, and then we get very, very accurately made CNC laser cut brackets from anywhere we like. So these particular brackets were bought from a very small, very local SME company. We sent them the digital files, they cut the, the brackets. Uh, the first time we did them, we made them sort of fairly manually. Literally the second time, they were about half price compared to the first time. So we didn't have to go very far before we started getting efficiencies. They get brought to site and then assembled by a team of people like IKEA who are trained to assemble these buildings. So we only need a handful of bracket types for any building. It does every condition. So if you're Heathrow Expansion or a small primary school, you could be using the same brackets. Um, the columns and beams can be any length you like, so you immediately get that kind of mass customization. <coughs> but the people on site, it's a yellow bracket, so I need my torque wrench set to X, I need two bolts and a, you know, whatever equipment I need. Um, so we're starting to prove how, I mean, we've built pharmaceutical facilities using Gurkhas, we've built bits of prison using prison industries, uh, we've used, built bits of Heathrow <coughs> using unemployed people from Crawley Job Centre. So we're starting to prove how quickly you could build all of these things. This is about 50% cheaper than traditional construction, but it can be assembled by a very, very diverse workforce very, very quickly. It's very accurate when we point cloud scanned it. The furthest anything was out from zero is about three millimeters. So the cladding guys who spend half their lives fixing gaps between their millimeter perfect systems and wobbly traditional concrete frames suddenly unleashes loads of benefit for them, mm. fit out fits like a glove. So yeah, it's a sort of relatively uh, yeah, simple result, but the way we got it was quite different and the opportunities it creates are potentially massive. We're now at the point where the, the last round of uh, Innovate CRD funding uh, Landsec bid with a company called Easy Space who did the prototyping. We're now testing what is the appropriate level of automation, firstly at the level of components, so how can we get robots welding, how can we get robots laser cutting components, so how much automation is right at the level of components and what level of automation is correct on site. So it's early days yet, but we reckon you could build a building maybe twice as quick with maybe 75% fewer people. And this is not kind of six axis robots and things on the site. It's kind of bits of kit you can already buy. We've bought quite a lot of this kit. But yeah, Platform 2 is starting to yeah, open up lots of possibilities about how quickly we can build these things, how few people, how safely we can make them, how diverse can we get the workforce. And it's starting to, to show some really interesting things. So all the benefits, um, I talked about the kind of transactional cost. This is the way we currently buy a project, massively fragmented, as everyone knows, massively hierarchical. The result is about 50p of every pound uh, that MOJ spends ends up as built assets. 49p disappears. Some of it into useful things like supply chain profit. A lot of it is just the inefficiency, the waste, the rework, the transactional cost, the profit on profit, the, the multiple handling. Where we want to get to is this space where we have libraries of components that can be configured digitally through configurators to make projects. Components can be bought through a wide, resilient supply chain assembled by uh, competent people, and that's how we'll start to build our, build our projects. Uh, test evidence so far, uh, on the pains to point out this is under idealized conditions, but Turner Townsend have been looking at this quite carefully and said under the right conditions, we could be looking at a, an overall 33% capital cost saving. So we think you'll get a load of whole life, whole life benefits in that anyway. Uh, I don't think we'll quite hit 33% for a while, but you know, plenty to go at. If you could hit 20%, you'd be laughing. Um, the work we have done for Ministry of Justice, KPMG did a benefits analysis. 
and they are showed again under the right conditions you could buy the facade system for about half the price of precast concrete at a time when this supply chain is stressed and this is creating uh, potentially opportunities for prisoners or diversifying the workforce so this is getting massive return social return on investment while also buying a thing quicker and cheaper which is got to be worth investigating um, we're already seeing clients talking much more closely to manufacturers so missing out big chunks of that sort of hierarchy in the middle uh, we've got at least a couple of clients now who are talking very very directly to manufacturers of components and materials and i think that's going to start to accelerate and this is why government's particularly interested in it. it understands this you know currently that's the way it buys schools no schools schools no schools if you started buying consistent components across multiple uh programs of work, you'd start to build up a kind of base load, which would give you then a sustainable pipeline, which then the manufacturers go, right, if I knew you were going to do that, I would start to invest and gear up and I'd meet you halfway, and suddenly you start to bring those worlds together. Uh, yeah, the, it's this stuff, we've been looking at how much we can get in a 40-foot shipping container, it's about five, nearly five and a half thousand cubic metres worth of Platform 2 stuff you can fit in a single 40-foot shipping container. So if you're HS2 Euston, if they do that, or Heathrow Expansion, you are all about logistics. So the idea that we're starting to look at how few vehicle movements, therefore how little stress on existing infrastructure, how little carbon, you can see all these things start to start to you know, sigma together, as Keith says. So what are we asking for? So superstructure, we're assuming it's uh, platform two. We would also be interested in uh, substructure systems. So again, we're looking for things that do more than one task. So if you have a substructure system which also reduces vibration, reduces excavation, acts a carbon sink, integrates ground source heat and cooling, that's the sort of innovation we're looking for. Um, or we recognise that Platform 2 might not do everything, so if you have a structural system, particularly ones around low embodied carbon or biotechnology, there's people printing or there's people growing concrete now, uh, we'd love to get those guys involved. Uh, the envelope <coughs> talked about does lots of these functions, the you know, insulation control, We'd like people coming forward with things that become energy positive buildings. So I'm sure people have heard about the uh, Active Building Centre. So we're looking for the sorts of technologies where the, the, the building can actually generate energy. There's loads of interesting things around articulation of the facade, how much kind of passive uh, versus active control of solar can you get. Uh, my guess would be that if the superstructure is designed for you know, massive permanence, facades might change in a 20 year cycle so if they were easy to pop off and replace and recycle then you know there might be a different cycle time so we're kind of interested to explore that uh, this is the stuff we did do at moj this was actually made by prisoners so i'm not saying this is by any means the the solution we're after but this demonstrates the principle we got a small group of prisoners we taught them how to make these blocks from first principles and they made themselves a kind of fully fitted out uh, a high performing piece of social infrastructure and about 75 percent of the things that happened were done by prisoners so we're already demonstrating admittedly on a small scale the potential for diversifying the workforce and getting manufacturing things that this does lots of things for you whilst also creating new types of roles mep again i won't go through this in detail because you can download the slides but um <clears throat> all of these things keith talked about this kind of life cycle thing so looking at ease of maintenance my guess would be at some point IoT is going to generate vast amounts of data. That's the sort of thing you could feed into machine learning. We work already do that, and you could start to get that telling the services how to operate. So you could start to get self-optimizing buildings, which I think would be quite cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've talked about this idea of integrating all the products, and again, my guess would be that uh, if the, the facade sort of changing on a 20 year life cycle, the fit out might change in a 10, 20 year life cycle. So again, you might get kicked apart buildings where superstructure stays where it is, the internal fit out flexes over time, changes over time, self optimizes over time. So all of these things we're interested to explore. Fit out, yeah, you can imagine lots and lots of benefits of uh, some forms of modern method construction get diluted once you get to the fit out stage where you still have hundreds of people running around site getting in each other's way. So we'd like to get rapidly installed kits of parts. Again, multi-function. Uh, so rather than have lots of distinct trades, we get potentially uh, skilled groups of people who can assemble the entire fit out, tiny group of people putting an entire apartment fit out together, for instance. 
<coughs> and uh, oh, sorry, it's gone the wrong way. Yeah, and obviously, as I said, we'd like to combine these. So we'll be looking for people coming up with internal wall systems, which are also the buzz bar for the, the connections, also has all the kind of, you know, the wiring IoT stuff within it, ceilings that immediately have all of the kind of ventilation, all of the kind of MEP type systems combined within them. What we want is a tiny, tiny kit of parts that clips into the building and does the fit out with all the services, etc. <coughs> um, Again, won't go through these. Sustainability is going to be a, a big driver for us in terms of uh, reducing carbon in the buildings, looking at the impact of climate change. So we're expecting, you know, we're going to have to design buildings for very different conditions over the next 50 years. So all of these things we're going to be very interested in. Uh, and the other thing that we, I'm really keen on is this, uh, also looking at the yellow goods. So what are the right tools for the job? Because if we're starting to make buildings in different ways, we're going to start needing new techniques. Um, I know there's companies doing automatic laser scanning and comparisons of as built with as designed, people doing uh, laser projections of setting out points and things. We're starting to look at what's the kind of right level of auto automation on site. We know that JCB and people are looking at this. So again, I think there's a whole kind of supporting infrastructure uh, that we'll be asking people to come forward on. So what we're going to build is a two-storey building uh, using platform two, so eight metre spans, corridor width to be determined, but let's assume 2.4, 3.6, give or take floor to floor height. Um, I think that in the first instance we're going to fit it out as a school, but I would like to prove the point that it could have been fitted out as one of a number of other building types over the course of it, but I think we're focusing on schools, is that fair? Time being. Uh, and yeah, if any of this is interesting, there's loads more stuff about it. There's the platform books that have already been published. Uh, we did a piece of work with the MTC and the Ministry of Justice over a sort of 18 month period, which is all documented in here and talks about this was the kind of first steps where we've brought manufacturing and construction together. Um, talks through the, the different work packages we developed, which was looking at things like quality assurance, uh, virtual prototyping the factory, kind of virtual planning of the factory, and starting to really bring these two worlds together. So this was the kind of starting point of a much bigger journey, but again, anyone bidding probably needs to read that because it will bring you up to speed on the story so far. Uh, so that's me done. That was not too bad, actually, was it? Ahead of time. Yeah, ahead of time, see, you see. <laughs> this is... um, yeah, so thanks for that. I will now hand over to Mark, who will talk you through the details.